usually through commercials, which was part of his concept of what would work on a mass audience. They were directors who were never going to cross him in any serious way, who didn't have the power to, but more than that, who didn't have the desire to. They were not about to make the deal and then say, um, uh, okay, get off the set, I'm running the show. They were directors who basically worked for Don. I wasn't sure about talking when I read the script, you know, but Beggars Couldn't Be Choosers, to be honest with you. It was my second film, and the first film was hated in Hollywood. It was called The Hunger, you know, and um, there was thought it would be an art movie. And then the boys offered me uh, Top Gun, and I had a vision about Top Gun. You know, I wanted to do something like Apocalypse Now on an aircraft carrier, you know, and these guys had a particular vision, and they gave me no room in terms of my vision, in terms of the, the darker side I wanted to bring to it. And in the end, they were right, and I was wrong. They had, a, they had a particular vision about what this movie should be, and the movie wasn't an all-out, balls to the wall, um, silver jets against blue-black skies and, and rock and roll stars of the skies, as they call these guys. And that was their vision, and I had something which was dark and more intense and European, and they... <sighs> Tony says, well, let's turn the carrier around to get the sun in the other direction. And the Admiral says, that cost $150,000 and take a day. Tony said, so? Let's do it. We said, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> Don was much smarter than any of the people around him all the time. When you foreshadow an event early on in a movie, or you, and then you establish the event, you try and mirror it sometime later. As a matter of fact, Chekhov had this notion that if you've got a rifle in the second act, you better go off and kill somebody in the third act. I always felt that he knew more than anyone else about filmmaking, and he always had this expression, just give me the money, and meet me at the at the box office, and I will, you know, um, I'll produce a, a hit for you. And uh, and he did. What we did here is, as we were when we were on location, we we're shooting the picture. We said, you know what? We need a moment of real emotion between these guys that isn't fake, that's real. And we're going to try. We're going to take a chance. And Cruz didn't really want to play this scene. Uh, and neither did Ice Man, really. Um, Val. They, they weren't they weren't overjoyed with the thought of two guys doing what these two guys are about to do. Don would have told anyone who wanted to know that Simpson and Bruckheimer were the most successful producers in the history of show business. And in fact, they were very, very successful. They had an enormous track record, record through the 80s, hit after hit, not just hit, blockbuster after blockbuster. And they acquired an extraordinary amount of power, which was reflected in the deal that they made with Paramount. At the height of their careers, Simpson and Bruckheimer signed a lucrative deal with Paramount Pictures worth $500 million. It was an unprecedented amount of money, and it gave them control to produce the movies they wanted. It was almost too good to be true. As only Don Simpson could do, he named his deal, and it was called Visionary Alliance. And, and I was to you know, do the publicity on the deal. There were ads in the trades, there were ads in national papers, and this was a big news story. But the problem was that it's hard to sort of do press and toot your own horn without someone stabbing you in the back. It was actually unheard of for a producer to have that kind of press around a deal. And of course it went down very badly in Hollywood and everybody felt that Don was really riding for a fall. Well, you certainly got my attention. Great driving, great recovery, Cole. The first picture under the new deal was Days of Thunder. Set in the world of motor racing, it was another Tom Cruise vehicle. This one, though, was heading for a crash. Everybody had such high hopes for the movie, I thought it was going to be a huge box office smash because Tom Cruise, behind the wheel of a race car, and one exec at, at Paramount said he could sit and smoke a cigarette for 100 minutes behind the wheel of a race car and just make a huge amount of money, and they were wrong. The press and everybody was after Don and Jerry because they'd been so successful. They'd had three movies in a row which were all huge, huge hits, you know. So they were, you know, Hollywood can't wait for someone to fail. We are all slaves to the process of the movie itself. The, the movie is our mistress. We serve here. We serve her. It's, it's our job and our mission to try and, and get the best movie we can, and the movie has a life of its own. That movie can become a monster and get out of control. There's a crash coming out of turn four, Cole. The truth is, all of us are trying to ride the back of the monster known as the movie. We're trying to make sure everybody stays on, and we're trying to feed the monster at the same time. So far, we've crashed about 65 cars. 
Uh, and uh, these are the only ones that are running today. I'm sitting with the editor, and Jerry comes over and says, so is it a piece of shit? And the editor, Billy Weber, goes, yeah. She gets in her car to leave? Yeah. Where does that occur? In the parking lot. You know, we we'll uh, probably never use that. Why? Well, because what she'll say to Cruz is they'll have the exchange. I can't watch. No, but what she you'll, you'll never see her get in the car. Days of Thunder was at, at just a, an over-the-top production in every sense of the word. And this was just when Don became very self-destructive and very much a self-parody. It was such a testosterone-charged production. He had Tom Cruise, who was just red hot. It was too much excitement, and, and the hubris got to be too great. On the one hand, you have what everybody expected of us, and on the other hand, you have what, what we expected of ourselves. And, and you put the two, two things together. Not only did, did we think we didn't make such a great movie, Everybody else was telling us, you know, so, so you're down and you're getting kicked. That's, you know, that, that's, that's tough. I see it! He knew that he was in a business where perception is reality. And I think the, the critics' treatment of Days of Thunder, the public's treatment of Days of Thunder, and Hollywood's treatment of the movie hurt him. He was really mad at me for writing that Days of Thunder was a failure. And boy, did he, he never let me forget it, because Days of Thunder made quite a lot of money in box office gross. But the fact of the matter is that Days of Thunder cost a lot of money, and it was a chaotic, agonizing production, and it essentially led to this rupture with Paramount. The failure of Days of Thunder meant Paramount pulled out of the deal. The deal's over. How do we feel about it? It was a great deal. Simpson had to endure a very public humiliation. A lot of where Don's strength came from, I think, was success. You know, and it's a very ephemeral sort of success. I mean, this, it's, this town is dangerous in this way. You know, because if you fall from grace, I mean, you fall at the speed of light. I think Don knew that because of his personality and behavior and kind of the uh, mythology that he created about Don Simpson, I mean, Don really was sort of this self-created, bigger-than-life myth, which he wanted to be, that he was a target. And it was hard for him to understand that totally. As tough and aggressive and hard-skinned as he wanted people to think he was, that surface was not thick at all. And Days of Thunder probably was that first crack in the wall. Don was a very, very fragile individual, you know. And even on the surface, there's always bravado and this toughness and this macho quality. But underneath, he was a very gentle, very fragile, very sensitive guy, overly sensitive, uh, to the point of being paranoid, you know. And, um, and, and failure of, in any form really hurt him. All he did, he'd, he'd go into his hole and hide. He'd go off to Hawaii or he'd go off, to, off the Canyon Ranch where he spent a lot of time. And he'd hide, you know, until everything had, had blown over. He couldn't face, couldn't face the, the music in terms of failure. Simpson now became increasingly reclusive. Hollywood's first rock and roll executive retreated behind the walls of his multi-million dollar mansion to indulge his demons, including a taste for what he called commercial sex. I knew Don Simpson for approximately five years, of which I spent about six months around him directly. And uh, the time that I spent around him was, was probably the most insane wicked and self-destructive time of my life. You know, like when you meet a lady and she says, well, would you like to make love? Well, the first thing I'd like to do is fuck, not make love.